Welcome to the Dublin Bible Talks, midweek Bible talks for workers in Dublin. I'm Cameron Jones. Most of us live comfortably with routine. We know where everything fits and we know where we're going. But some meetings, confrontations, they change all of that. Today in Mark chapter 1, we find that the biggest disruption to normality is Jesus Christ. And why not disrupt your normal working week by joining us live on Wednesdays from your workplace, 1pm Dublin time on... Most of us don't like it when our life is disrupted. When events or people change our plans and our decisions... When the track we're on is just disrupted by illness or accident or crime or violence, our lives, you'll remember very clearly, were significantly disrupted by COVID. All the plans that we had for those years were in bat tatters. And in many ways, we're still leave, living with that kind of disruption. But it's not always bad things that disrupt our lives. The announcement of an engagement Uh, that someone's about to be married, and that's true for someone who's on our call right now, coming up very soon. The arrival of a child in a family, uh, those are not bad things. In fact, they're very good things, but they mean that you can't just do things like you used to. If you've got a new child, you, you can't just jump in the car and go. There's any number of other things you have to take with you now. Most of us live comfortably with routine. We know where everything fits. We know where we're going. But some meetings, some confrontations, they change all of that. And the biggest disruption to normal life, the biggest disruption to normal decisions, to normal normal patterns of relationship, comes in Jesus Christ. You cannot mean business with Jesus and remain the same as you were before. If he enters your life, it can't just go on like it did before. And if it does... It probably means that you haven't really encountered him. You haven't really understood him because he always disrupts life. It's true today and it was true back in first century Palestine. And the events in the middle of Mark 1 that we're looking at today are the very first recorded actions of Jesus' ministry. Maybe you might think about what is it? What is it that if you are going to meet with a person and speak about the story of Jesus and introduce Jesus for the first time, what story from Jesus' life would you tell them? Where would you start? Well, what we're going to have a look at today is where Mark starts, which is probably Peter's memory, where he used to start when he was introducing people to Jesus. From his baptism to his arrest, Jesus is accompanied by a select group of witnesses, people who kept a record for us. If you remember last time, we left Jesus about to begin. It was about to bring a simple message to the people of Galilee that area of northern Israel. Jesus was saying, The time has come, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent, turn around, and believe the good news. Now the events from verse 16 and onwards demonstrate that the kingdom really has come. Verse 16 again. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew cast the net into a lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and they followed him. When he'd gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. And without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. What happened that day was unusual in more ways than one. It was not the way rabbis usually gained disciples. It was usually the other way around. A disciple went hunting for a teacher, and they went searching for one, (laughs) rabbi shopping, and they found the best one, the one that they thought was the best, and then the one that they respected, the one they wished to attach themselves to... But here you notice it's the teacher who is selecting the students. Now that's a little detail that tells us something important. It tells us that Jesus is in control every step of the way in this. 
In John's account of Jesus' life, we find out that these men, they'd already been followers of John the Baptist. But Jesus had come to the Sea of Galilee with a purpose. And these men were not sitting around hoping that Jesus would come and get them, hoping that today would be the day when they would go with him. No, these were men busy with their normal life, with their normal routines. When Jesus came along on that day, he disturbed their lives. He disrupted their plans. He turned their lives upside down. Simon and Andrew left their nets. They had to break up with their past. What else could they do for Jesus has come? And for James and John, the, the issue is even more serious. Did you notice? See, they left their nets. They left their boat, but they also left their father. But what could they do when Jesus had come? And called them. In this we are meant to see that this meeting with Jesus is something that turned their lives upside down. But it could not be any other way considering who he was, considering who he is. Jesus elaborates on his call as he speaks to Simon and Andrew. You notice his call has a purpose to it. Following him gives them a mission. Following him will make them fishers for men. Now, at first glance, there is a simple explanation of what he means. They'll be doing what they've been doing all their lives up to now, except the catch is going to be different. They're going to need, a bit, uh, they're going to need, need bigger nets for men and not fish. <laughs> See, God's great concern for the world is not with fish, God's great concern for the world is with humanity. Go ahead, get involved with environmental work. That's great and that's good and that's fine. But if you think that that is the big work of God in the world, then you're mistaken. But there's more in this than that. Because this needs to be understood with the whole of the Old Testament in the background. The whole of the history of Israel in the background. And unless we realise that, we, we might miss the point of what's going on here. Because in the Old Testament, the fishing of men is a task that is God's task. Take down these references if you want to look them up later on. But you'll see in Jeremiah chapter 16, from verse 16 and following, from Ezekiel 29, from verse 4 and following, and from Amos chapter 4, verse 1 and following, and Habakkuk chapter 1, all four of those references have uh, imagery of fishing, but it is God who is doing the fishing of men. And in those references, the fishing of men is the idea of gathering people in in the face of certain judgment. And against that background, we see Jesus calling his disciples is even more radical than we might think. Because what he's saying as he calls for these fishers to join in his work is he's saying judgment's coming. It's just round the corner. <laughs> Hasn't he just said the kingdom of God is at hand? Repent and believe the good news. And notice that as we're talking, as we're sitting right here and now, that these are not just the words of some radical Australian who's picked up stumps and found himself in a new country on the other side of the world. If you have an issue with that language of judgment, you don't have an issue with Cameron. You have an issue with Jesus. These men called by Jesus on that day are to be involved in the gathering of people so that they will be rescued from the judgment that is coming, God's judgment. Jesus' coming means that judgment is just around the corner. Jesus' coming confronts men and women with God's decisive action regarding evil, including ours. All people are confronted with the decision. And these fishermen called by Jesus, their job is to help people make the decision, to help people choose to be confronted with the decision that they must make. They are to bring these people of, that they will encounter as fishers of men face to face with their need to decide. And that's all necessary. Why? 
because Jesus has come. Now, Jesus' call is a radical call. You notice Jesus' call calls for a radical break with the past. It calls for a radical mission, bringing people out from under the judgment of God. Jesus has disrupted these men's lives forever, and only he has the authority to do that. Now, Christian friends, men and women on this call who are called by Jesus, you know of God's judgment on you and all your colleagues, and you know of Jesus and his call not only to you that saves, but to your colleagues that will save them if they believe. And knowing that, what are you going to do? Can you really keep silent when you know what your colleagues face and you know how they can be saved from it? Will you not start to have a plan for how you can share this extraordinary message with them? Well, the seriousness of this message is even more clear as we move on in this passage. For Jesus takes his new followers to back to their hometown, Capernaum. Have a look at chapter 1, verse 21 of Mark with me. Look there. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not like the teachers of the law. Just then a man came, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching, and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits, and they obey him. News spread about him quickly over the whole region of Galilee. What is it that made Jesus stand out as he came into their synagogue that day? He was different to the other teachers that they'd experienced. I mean, they were used to getting teaching week in and week out, but Jesus was different. Jesus didn't just debate fine Bible trivia. Jesus didn't just debate the opinions of the rabbis down through the ages on this passage or that passage or its meaning and its application. No, when this man, Jesus, spoke, they all knew that they had been addressed by God. Perhaps that is what drew out this man possessed by an impure spirit, an unclean spirit, as he comes to see Jesus. But notice that from the beginning, it's an unclean spirit in the man who is on the defensive. The unclean spirit realises the threat Jesus is to its existence. He knows who this man is. And more than anyone else... This impure spirit understands the significance of Jesus being here amongst his people. The ultimate disruption is about to take place in the life of this demon-possessed man, and the unclean spirit is afraid. The unclean spirit has no message as he comes to Jesus. He's got no defence. He's not cause. He doesn't have a cause that he can present or a case to offer up. From the very beginning, the language he uses here is that of an inferior addressing their superior. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? The question is of a subordinate, one who is afraid that their punishment, their destruction is just about to be dealt out to them. And notice in this encounter, there's no struggle. It's not like those films where there's this great battle between a man and a fearsome spirit and there's no heads spinning and all that kind of thing. There's no ghost that inspires terror. There is no spirit of the dead that needs to be placated. I've noticed living in Ireland the amount of fear people have as they try to assuage things using symbols and statues and offerings and sayings. 
references to the Blessed Mother and crossings and statues covered with offerings like little shoes and garlands. It's not dissimilar to offerings in other places made to Ganesh or a, another deity. People, people might even believe the fairies do have an influence. So you need to be careful. Loved ones who have passed away need to be honoured or they might just do some damage to us. Be careful around this place or that tree or this well or that spring. You should do things right. You should avoid them because they have some power. But notice here, as Jesus comes, there is no resistance because the unclean spirit knows who it is who stands before them. The master of heaven and earth himself. Jesus will not be fully exposed or revealed for who he is yet. That doesn't happen until the cross. It's not until then that what we see here will be properly understood. But in what happens next, we see Jesus in complete control. Just as he is in control when he called Simon and Andrew and James and John. There is no competition going on here. The demon doesn't put up a good fight and lose. There is no dualism here in Christianity where light and dark and good and evil are to be found in some kind of a balance. No, notice here that with one act of destruction, as feeble as it is, this unclean spirit departs from this man's life at the word of Jesus and everyone marvels and they speak about Jesus' authority. You see here that Jesus doesn't use a technique. He doesn't use a spell. He doesn't use some kind of incantation. There is no symbolic act. There is just Jesus' word. And it brings the battle lines close because of who he is, because of why he has come. Jesus, Jesus had the authority, the authority to call Simon and Andrew and James and John, and they responded. Jesus has the authority even to command an unclean spirit, and they must obey. Friends, this is no ordinary man who came to Capernaum that day. This is no ordinary man who faces you and me right now in the text as we read it. When Jesus stands before a person, whether it's a fisherman in Galilee, whether it's a demon-possessed man in Capernaum, or a man and a woman in Dublin or Paris or Northern Ireland or Australia or Mauritius or Kenya or Uganda, what happens then is the most serious confrontation in life. It is the most important confrontation in life. Jesus brings choices. And dealing with him means dealing with the most terrifying of facts. Who he is, the Son of God incarnate, why he came. God's judgment is just around the corner. The world is on notice. The end is near. And we who are Christians are all part of the rescue mission. We are called, we are gathered. Oh yes, we might have different tasks and different abilities. You can be sure of that. And we may find ourselves in different mission fields. We're not going to Israel to do this work. We've got to do it right here where we find ourselves. But we are part of God's rescue mission in order to give other people the way to escape from the judgment that is coming. You see, being a fisher of men is a deadly serious business. It means being urgent about this message. The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the gospel. Just take a minute and think about the people who you know who currently stand under the judgment of God with no hope, without the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And right now, maybe you could spend a minute asking for opportunities for yourself, asking that God would bring other people into their lives also to share the message of Jesus that rescues them as it's rescued you.
Thank you for listening to the recording of the Dublin Bible Talks. You can join us in real time on Wednesdays at 1pm Dublin time on Zoom, bit.ly slash Dublin Bible Talks. That's bit.ly slash Dublin Bible Talks.